first afternoon session. We're very honored to have with us today Dr. Stephen Bullock, who is the author of the book Revolutionary Brotherhood. Um, Freemasonry and the Transformation of the American Social Order. So I think this will mesh very nicely with our morning presentation. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for the introduction. And um, so pleased to have you have you here. And um, I'm going to sort of take you take you guys through the sort of revolutionary period. And if you can then stand to go through the next one, we're going to sort of go from there to the um, through what I'm going to what I'm calling the first golden age of American Freemasonry, the years after the sort of from the end of the revolution up to the 1820s when, when masonry sort of has its, the height of its importance and um, broader public significance. And I have no idea what the room is like, so you guys in the back can, we can, hear can let me know we and, and give me a sign or go like this or stand up and, or maybe some of you want to go back. <laughs> yeah, you do, but, but they're secret, so. How would I know? This is a and sorry. It's all right. Nope. Lovin's the and and I guess you guys should know. I guess you've already seen. I'm not a Freemason, so um, this is an outsider speaking. Um, somebody who was who started as an academic and didn't know hardly didn't know virtually anything about about Freemasonry and. Um, someone who sort of came to recognize a lot of the significance of that, of that world. And I just have to have an application in my pocket. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, so nice of you guys, I appreciate it. This is the, I hear that a lot actually, so that I've been, and I'm honored, but. Um, so, so this is the, this is that period, and had I known this was going to sit up here for so long, I would have made a nicer one. I just usually leave it up for like a few seconds, and then it's gone. So, um, and I don't know what's. Did I get the? Did I get the thing? There we are. Okay, okay. And you guys are going to have to witness my struggle, but you know I'm a historian. So, and am I pushing forward? Let's just do that. Nope. Nope. That's not the. Does anyone know? I guess it's supposed to work, but. They got a, they got a. Um, oh, and oh, oh. Just use the mouse. We could do that. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think they. That was the replacement for the old one, and they said this one definitely works after struggling with the old one. So, so the evidence is such that, the evidence well, is such that that, okay, okay, you have to depend upon you. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you crossing the so. <laughs> all right, well that was supposed to be, this is supposed to be the great reveal here. This is supposed to be, and some of you guys are shocked by this, so I hope you get over your, your sense of feeling here. Um, so, so I want to begin with American Union Lodge, which is a sort of one of the great lodges of the, of the American Revolution, the um, um, a group that um, was one of the most active groups and in March of 1779. It was an extremely active group um, uh, meeting, I think, six times in one month in early, early 1779 and then, and then having a, a large celebration that attracted a whole bunch of people, so much they decided to have another large celebration in June. So, so this is a world in which, in which officers are, are excited about Freemasonry and, and really sort of heavily involved. And the June celebration that I'll talk more about later on um, is a celebration that involves George Washington that has him there, the, the great leader of the, of the revolution. And of course, Washington is a great hero, the, you know, the central figure 
uh, the American Revolution, the, um, as James Thomas Flex Flexner's book calls the indispensable man. Um, and of course, this is the Emanuel Leutz's um, 19th century reconstruction of Washington crossing the Delaware, the, um, the kind of overwhelming painting. And if you haven't, if you haven't been to the Metropolitan Museum and in New York, you should go because this is this is not the size of a quarter, which you would think it was from there. This is the size of um, could be a small boat, actually. It's, it's an extraordinary kind of piece. Uh, but Washington is often seen as the guy here on the boat directing the people standing, standing tall. Well, maybe one other guy gets to stand that way, but he can't look forward in the same way. And everyone else kind of huddles in the huddles in the in the boat. And I think and and I think that's not that's not the whole story here. You know, masonry um, in the Revolution. That story has all sorts of figures. Um, of course, most of the people we know, of course, are, are major figures. They are they are in some ways often indispensable men. Um, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Paul Revere, uh, these guys as well. But in some ways, um, for the survival of the Revolution, the survival of the of the army and thus the revolution. Um, um, and let me sort of explain that logic. The, um, as you all sort of know, right, the revolution was not, was not won in a sort of great feat of, of great military victories. Um, in some ways, it's much like you know, getting, the, getting the playoffs in the modern NBA. You, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to do all that great to get in the playoffs. Um, in some ways, um, Washington didn't have an extraordinary kind of military record in the sense of um, win, a win and loss sort of column. Um, but what he's able to do in an extraordinary kind of way is keep the army together. And, um, and, and, be, and because that army stays together, um, that allows people to win to revolution. If you didn't have the, if you didn't have the army, then um, it's almost impossible to imagine that the, the revolution could have been won. Um, and, and I think it's, it's not just that Washington was kind of a great administrator, um, a great sort of uh, motivator, um, but it was also the case that the officer, officer corps is able to hold together, which as we're gonna see is not something you can take for granted. Um, and I think a good deal of that credit in some ways goes to that, goes to Freemasonry and bringing them together, just like we saw with, with American Union Lodge. Um, so I want to look at um, a little bit on the broader background of early Freemasonry in America, how it was that some of these people got to Freemasonry, enough so they could propagate it um, among the officers, and a little bit on the coming of the revolution in Freemasonry before we get to the, to the, to the officer corps in the, in, in the revolution. Um, um, so let's, let's go back now, the, of course the key the key date in the arrival of Freemasonry as a fraternal group, that is a group which um, is not simply built around, around stone masonry, around architecture, um, around, a, around a, um, an occupation. Um, the, the key moment is sort of 1717 when, when Grand Lodge is formed in London. The, a number of groups who are already, in many ways, moving away from that sort of um, connection with connection with with the with the with the with the operative craft that's actually working, um, come together. Um, and of course, you know, tradition goes back farther, and that's clearly the case. And they actually saw themselves as as returning back to some sort of ancient inheritance. Uh, but they're also sort of looking forward, um, heading toward um, something different, an idea of, of masonry as a universal fraternity. Um, um, and this is, of course, an important period when, this, when the scientific revolution is, is developing, when religious liberty in the modern sense is developing, when people begin to get an idea uh, about sociability, about, pe about people wanting to get along with each other and wanting to hang out with each other. Um, in some ways, not um, that in the modern sense is not something you take for granted before then. Um, and then, of course, the idea of limited government, um, all coming to this. So, so Masons, of course, tend to look back 
farther back, not surprisingly. Um, but there's also something about that origin of Freemasonry in that, in that period, which is, which is also part of the inheritance of Freemasonry that, that perhaps Masons can celebrate. Uh, so this, this, new, for, this new order uh, spreads rapidly throughout the, the British Isles and, and into the continent and fairly quickly to America as well. And so by 1730 or so, you have, um, you have lodges, a lodge or two developing in America. By 1733, you have the first official lodge in America, in Boston. Um, um, but this is a very different sort of free, Freemasonry than, than, the, than what's going to happen after the American Revolution. Um, this is a, um, only a few dozen lodges um, by the time of the Revolution, perhaps a couple thousand Masons. So this is not a, this is not a, in fact, I think they're, I think they're not sort of desiring a mass kind of, a mass kind of um, recruitment of people. I think they probably thought of themselves as being sort of naturally relatively small. And uh, to give you some sense of that, maybe we can go to the, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a portrait of, a, of an early Freemason. This is a, um, this is a, an English Freemason, um, but it gives a sense of, of what's of these sort of expectations. Um, he's got the he's got the white gloves in his hand, which is sort of an important part of the early Masonic um, symbolism. Um, but just as important, it's a it's a sign of being a gentleman. It's a sign of being a um, being somebody of relatively high status. Um, and so all sorts of portraits in the in the 17th century, they're wearing, they're, they're holding gloves um, to show that kind of status. And this guy has that same sort of thing. He's got the, he's got the very nice wig. Um, and notice he's, looks like he shaved his head in order for that wig to, in order for that wig to do better. So you and I'm sort of trying to do it naturally. But <laughs> that seems to be going pretty well. Uh, um, when wigs come back, I'm going to be ready. Um, but he is clearly uh, somebody of that of that kind of status. He's um, he has the he has the nice shiny buckles on his shoes. He's standing in what actu what is actually a um, a very 18th century gentlemanly sort of way to stand. This is um, gentility um, and that and politeness was meant to be a sort of uh, not something which not something which is a which is sort of military stance, something very rigid and making sure that everyone is following the rules and um, that sort of thing. It is, um, it is a more kind of elegant, a, po a poised, sort of relaxed elegance. Um, and, that, and that sort of stance is, the, um, is, is sort of the way which is, is a better way to stand. It's, it's, it's a little more open. It's a very, very balanced sort of thing. You can, you can go both ways there. So this is a and of course, you can show off your calves. Show off those. They weren't as muscled back then, so this is not. They were not ripped, and people were saying, "Oh, look at that! He's been to the gym." But they had a little more. They were they environed the curves there, which, thankfully, you can't see mine. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that's the kind of thing, and and that's and that's early American Freemasonry. It's people coming out of that. That sort of thing, and here we have also the, the sort of poised, poised resting, sort of Napoleonic, right? This is we think of Napoleon, um, which is not it's not a it's not a dictatorship kind of pose. It's not saying I'm I'm emperor of the world, or I'm king of the world. As I guess you're supposed to say the, um, it's not a Titanic kind of moment. It's um, it's really kind of a relaxing sort of thing. Maybe um, maybe we'd. If we're a little bit less formal, we'd put our hands in our pockets. Mm -hmm. Same sort of thing. So, um, and took the invention of the modern sort of pocket to, to make that possible. It's a, it's a great increase in American civilization, I think. But these guys didn't have that. So, they, uh, so, so this, is a, this is a group which is meant to be high-ranking kind of people, which is meant to be uh, people of status. Um, and so this is a, um, this is that sort of thing. It is limited to coastal cities. Um, 
I guess we, um, some of you probably heard this morning, which I sadly I couldn't. I was um, um, still yeah. sleeping from yesterday's long travel and, and making sure the slides worked in some ways. And so far, out of three, we've done okay. <laughs> but you'll forgive me if they don't. Um, um, but um, it's only with the becoming of the revolution this begins to expand. In fact, I have a, I have a thing here if you can, um, you can show here. This is actually, I just brought this along. This is, this is not a Masonic procession, but as far as I know, it's the only, it's the only image of a profession, procession which um, we have from the revolutionary period. This is, um, this is actually the Tuesday Club from um, Annapolis um, there, but you get a sense of the uh, people there and some people going like this and the hands on hips and the, and the person along the way sort of you know, sort of thinking, oh, these guys are of high status. Well, this, they're actually mocking. It's a mocking bow, but it still has that sort of thing. People on the streets, people from the, from, the, from the windows are looking. There are actual reports of that um, in Boston and other areas that, um, that people would be watching from, the, from there, sometimes standing on fences, those sort of things. So uh, it's meant to be sort of seen. It's a visible sort of... Um, thing so, but it be, around the time of the revolution, it's beginning to change. The, uh, there are growing numbers of lodges, um, growing numbers of men who are sort of outside the higher levels of society. So it's beginning to spread, um, not just to the well-to-do. So, and when it's um, um, we're going we're to see the lodge of Saint Andrew in Boston in the 1750s. Or these are people who are who are not part of the group, not the sort of people who would be having dinner with the governor. Um, um, so um, they're often ambitious sort of people, but not people rise there. And the great example of that is Paul Revere, of course, who was, a, um, who was an enormously ambitious man, um, an extraordinarily um, artistic kind of guy, um, but not, not extremely learned, not extremely well-to-do. Um, and so with this, with this kind of membership, you know, the leaders of society, the aspiring kind of leaders of society. Um, it's not surprising that um, the fraternity sort of gets involved with the revolution. You know, this is the kind of people who are, who are at sort of at the head of the revolution. Um, um, and I guess it's not surprising as well that, that Masons don't all agree on things. They don't, they don't all rush to the, to the patriot side. Um, if you know about the revolution, you know it's not a, this is not something the whole, all of America rises up and says, get rid of those British. We, um, we hate them. This is instead a whole divided sort of thing. You have a number of loyalists in the fraternity. Um, in, in Boston, of course, you have, a, you have quite a few. Maybe we can go to the next. Um, um, Benjamin Hallowell is the customs commissioner, and, and he's actually abused, and that's the term which is used in the, in the diary, uh, by an angry mob. And, and, a, with, and one of the members of that angry mob, Paul Revere. Um, so this is actually, this is not about that mob, uh, but this is, um, this, is, uh, this is Paul Revere. This is a summons that he engraved uh, for, for what, maybe, maybe Salem? I don't know, you should look that up. Um, or you should look, read this again more closely. And Newburyport, sorry. So I knew it was a North Shore um, thing. The, uh, so he is, uh, about the same time, he is doing this to invite people to lodge. He's doing some of that in, in Boston, but he's also inviting people to go out and mob somebody sort of thing. He's inviting people to go out and spy on the British as well. So uh, similar sort of thing. Hallowell leaves the British troops. Um, he's a member of that, the older lodges and that older kind of class of lodges. At the same time, the, the person in charge of the old Grand Lodge actually takes the Grand Lodge jewels with him um, because he believes you know, things have gone crazy. The America's in the hands of, of anarchists and scary sort of people. Um, so I'm going to remove them. And then when order is restored, masonry will be able to come back there. Um, um, so, um, so, so many members did remain loyal to Great Britain, but of course other Masons were very active in that movement of resistance and then of revolution. The, um, uh, Peyton, Peyton Rudolph, who was the, the, the first president of the Continental Congress, 
um, is, a, is a Freemason. Um, when he dies, um, his successor in the Second Continental Congress is John Hancock, who was also a Mason, actually a, mem a, a member of, of the Lodge of St. Andrew um, there. And um, when he stops being the, the president, the next person's a Freemason as well. And that's Henry Lawrence. Um, so this is, a, this is a very active kind of thing. Um, um, in, in Boston, um, the former slave, Prince Hall, who's going to be, the, in some ways, the founder of, of African-American Freemasonry in America, uh, becomes a Mason around this time. Um, um, Dr. Joseph Warren, who was, the, who was a really important, um, um, a really important um, revolutionary figure, a, um, the man who he dies at the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, um, having been commissioned a general of the Continental Army, going to be a general. The commission had not yet come through. Um, so what did he do? He didn't say, I gotta wait for my commission, I can't be official. He actually went out and he fought as a private in the army there because he had that sense of duty. Um, and he actually dies there. So an extraordinary kind of figure, also a member of, of that group that Revere is a member, first Grand Master of that group when they create a Grand Lodge. And we have here, um, Warren becomes actually one of the first, one of the first heroes of the American Revolution. Um, he's one of those early people who get eclipsed later on because people later on are more celebrated. And of course, George Washington becomes the central figure uh, things. Uh, but here we have him um, being celebrated by heaven, in a sense. Um, um, so these men, these men, of course, are playing a role as individuals, right? We have Revere versus Hallowell. Um, on different sides, uh, argue with each other in a sense. Um, but there is, there is one important um, sort of direct Masonic connection um, that I did want to mention here that um, it's closely related to the Lodge of St. Andrew as well, um, um, which includes, as I said, Warren, his close friend Paul Revere. Um, Revere, of course, is, a, is an active patriot. He is, he is in some way one of the sort of um, the person you can trust to do, do things. Um, sort of a uh, familiar figure in, in modern, modern lodges, probably, I'm assuming since you guys are here and involved, probably some of you are those people. They get called upon to do everything. Uh, but he's, um, he does that sort of thing. He's, he becomes a messenger for that group. You know, that's why he is the, that's why he is going out on that midnight ride. He's the guy they trust to go out and to, and to warn the different Patriot groups that that the regulars are coming out, the British soldiers are coming out, and we have actually here a, um, a um, this is a this is a this is a an engraving of a figure that he draws on the um, that he draws and creates um, on the Boston Common. I think it's celebrating the the um, the repeal of the Stamp Act. Um, there, so this incredibly com complex symbolism there, which, um, which, which I began to decipher a little bit, and then I sort of gave up eventually, uh, um, or I think I, I think I eventually said I'm not going to get this, so uh, I'm not going to remember everything anyway. So this, this is some sort of symbolic structure. Now the the meeting place of the Lodge of St Andrews is, is the Green Dragon Tavern. So um, this is a it's a building that they bought. Um, they're a little embarrassed by the name, actually, the Green Dragon. Sounds a little bit, you know, a little bit, a little bit strange. There actually was a Green Dragon sticking out there, so it made, made perfect sense. Um, but they, for a while, they tried to call it the Mason's Arms. Prefer to, you know, that fits in better with a nice, fancy outlook of a Freemason, uh, a little more high, high tone there. Um, we can go to the next one. And the, um, this is their Masonic certificate, um, the sense of aspiration of uh, reaching toward higher things, of course, is sort of key. But the tavern becomes not only the center of the lodge, but a center for meetings for people resisting the British. Um, um, of course, not the only place, not, the, not necessarily the most important one, but it is its kind of place there. Um, and actually, the, one of the brothers there, um, William Palfrey, was actually the secretary of the Sons of Liberty. So, so you have that kind of connection, um, and that's and that's the kind of group there. Do we have the do we have the image of the of the green dragon? I guess not. So, um, 
So we can leave it there because, because we're getting to the story of the, of the Boston Massacre, which is this kind of extraordinary um, kind of activity, like 347 crates of tea. Um, this is, by the way, not little boxes of tea. Um, um, this is more like um, not, even a, not even a box which they bring out to, to, fit, to, to one pack in the, in the grocery store. This is almost like a, maybe a pallet of tea, in a sense. Um, and this is kind of extraordinary. You can see the, you can see the tea <laughs> sort, of, sort of still floating. It's still floating the next morning. So this is a huge kind of endeavor. It takes, takes a lot of work to do that. And, and, and so this is something organized. Um, and it seems like the, the um, <coughs> it seems like the Green Dragon Tavern is a center for that for organizing that. Um, and the um, and the American Antiquarian Society, which is where I do um, most of my uh, most of my research, um, sort of my scholarly home, um, is has actually a drawing of the Green Dragon Tavern, which which has a notation say this is where we planned essentially the Boston Tea Party. So. So that comes from, it already comes from that period. Um, um, and so let's go on to the next slide. We'll see where we are in the, um, here we, oh, they not only have it, but I have, a, I have an image of it. Sorry, I thought that was gonna come earlier. So um, there we are, this is the, and there's the green dragon there, and there's the, there's the, um, there's the little, little handwritten sort of signature there about we doing that, so. Um, but let's let's move on to the uh, move on to the what do we have next here? The um, um, Paul Revere. Did we go? Is that backwards? Maybe or probably not. Just go ahead. Go. Uh, all right. We're gonna move. We're gonna now move into the to the Revolutionary Period. <coughs> um, half about halfway through. So um, we'll try to get more than we'll try to be more than halfway through here. So you guys can ask some questions. We can talk some more. Obviously, um, you guys. Um, willing to come here and be one of the few people, although it's possible you guys in the front have the better chairs than um, they do. Um, maybe we can advertise that and get more people next time. Um, so, so the Continental Army, let's, let's sort of move to that. And I already mentioned American Union Lodge. Now let's look at that, at that major celebration of June 24th, St. John's Day. Um, that day, um, it involves more than 100 brothers um, more than 100 um, Continental Army officers marching from West Point. Um, um, three different generals join in that procession. Um, one of the other members is Daniel Shays, um, who's pretty obscure at that point, but is going to become widely known as the, as the guy who leads the Shays Rebellion in the seven, mid 1780s, which is, which is seen by Western. Um, by Western uh, Massachusetts people as being sort of a continuation of the revolution, standing up against, against unfair taxation. So, uh, uh, and this enormously symbolic kind of thing, they have the sword of justice, they have the Bible all being carried. Um, they proceed to a tavern where um, they're met by a number of gentlemen, including their Masonic brother, George Washington, um, there they have this enormously long um, celebration that night, uh, kind of overwhelming, even for even for you guys who have or, who prior sat through two talks and uh, to two and a half and one and a half more to go. Um, this is this includes a sermon, a Masonic address. Um, they have dinners, they have toasts, they have singing along with the toasts. Um, and, and after this all, George Washington leaves, and everyone follows him out to the, out to the Hudson. He gets on his, his barge, and they sort, of, uh, they sort of cheer, you know, back and forth from the barge and the, and the shore, kind of this extraordinary kind of moment. Um, enormous kind of appeal uh, with the music all going all along this time. The, uh, uh, and, um, and this is sort of a symbolic of things, because like, you have a substantial number of Continental Army officers, as I said, becoming Freemasons. Um, um, the only sort of thing we can, you know, the only sort of hard data we can get is sort of around, I think around 40%, around 42% of, of all the people who, who were named as generals um, during the thing actually have a Masonic connection. Now some of them get it later. 
um, but that's probably pretty close. The, um, and it's and from the looking at some of the minutes there, you see um, the lower ranks are also probably proportionally involved there. Maybe a few more at that lower level that um, that sort of run these lodges. Um, um, and all you have about ten lodges formed just for the military, just for the camps of the army. Um, there, um, this is this is. This is one of the Masonic generals. This is General Otho Holland Williams, which is quite a name. I don't know what his parents were thinking when they um, named him Otho Holland. Um, but key figure um, there. Um, let's try to look at you know, why, why this would be so popular. Why would, why would Mason be something people? Um, first of all, you know, being in the Army was a really disorienting experience. Um, it still is today. And, um, some ways, particularly for these guys. This is a, it's a very long war, um, 1775. Um, this begins before the Declaration of Independence to 1783. You know, two years after the, um, after the battle right near here and then the Battle of Yorktown. Um, but it's also much more disorienting than wars had been for early Americans. Early Americans went to war um, in communities, not as communities, of course, not everybody going out to do that, but, but a group would be mustered out of the, out of the locality and maybe a few, a few localities nearby. Um, all of, and so when you're going out, you are with people you know in some ways or have perhaps even have some close connections to. And the people, in, the people who are the officers who are, who are at least in, in New England elected directly by the, by the soldiers, are tend therefore to be local leaders, community leaders. Um, and so you have that sort of thing. The revolution breaks that sort of chain there. They, they begin to break up local units and spread people there. So you have people who are from certain areas who are placed into other lines, those sort of things. And those other lines then go on to different, different, different states. So it's a, a much more difficult sort of thing there. Um, um, and so this is a this is a disorientary thing. They have, this is a portrait of um, it's a portrait of Rufus Putnam there, um, a sign of um, somebody. And this is this is probably um, at this stage someone who cannot afford to have an oil portrait. So this is just a uh, more like a crayon drawing here. Um, and Rufus Putnam actually was somebody who was, uh, speaks of his father as being illiterate. Now it's not really clear if his father is actually totally illiterate, but um, not that clear, not somebody of high sort of status who was brought up to become a leading figure there actually, um, and a major kind of, a major kind of officer there. Um, somebody can wear those ruffles um, there, but it's, but that's hard. And it's hard to be, it's hard to be in charge of, of lots of soldiers if it's something which is not part of your background. If you're not used to bossing people around to giving orders, this is a different kind of thing. Uh, um, so masonry is significant because it because it, it conveys that sense that that the masons are part of that are part of that group the, who are important part of that gentlemanly kind of group. Um, um, masonry also helps with another problem. You know, how do you deal with with disorientation and and the problem of disorientation of status as well. Um, how do you deal with the problem of simply needing to build a new community? How do you connect with people from all these different, not just, not just other, other towns near you, but people from other states, people from faraway states? Um, and not only that, but are, you're being taken to all those out of the way kind of states. You are, you are brought to, um, to West Point, um, which today doesn't sound that kind of extraordinarily difficult. You get a train from New York City or from Albany and, and go there. That was a pretty kind of um, awful kind of place. General Samuel Holden Parsons um, writes to his wife from West Point and says, you know, I don't even know to, I don't even know how to talk about where I am. He said it's, you know, the hearing about news is just accidental around here. It's a, um, <laughs> so this is a, a, a movement kind of thing. And fraternal ties, therefore, provide a way of, of building people together, of tying them kind of thing. Um, so, this is, um, so this is a way of building that. And, and that's a really tough thing for, for officers who are, who are being brought 
like Rufus Putnam, who was being brought to being to being a a um, a leader a leader of of, of men um, for the first time. Um, masonry helps uh, deal with the problems of him rising up and then beginning to say, "That's great. Maybe I deserve this. So why don't I deserve? Why don't I deserve to be treated better than that guy over there, who was actually?" who was actually um, promoted after me. That's not fair. This is just not right. There are all these kind of squabbles. You know, who comes first? Who should, be, who should get the precedence first? So um, and this, is, this is a major kind of issue for that. Um, so people are um, having those same kind of anxieties. So, so masonry provides a way of dealing with those things, bringing people together, uh, bringing people a sense of having something to do in these camps, um, still the case, I think, in the, uh, the military. It's a lot of, a lot of sitting around waiting, sort of thing. The, um, and that's true of particularly these guys. And so, um, and um, so, um, it mitigates the cares and fatigues of the soldier's life. Says one of the, one guy remembering the revolution. He said that it's a way of dealing with those kind of difficulties. There, do we have? Show the next slide and. Um, um, here we have, here's the diversity of, um, here's that kind of diversity we're talking about. This is, um, this is I think, a French officer in Yorktown actually goes to, um, um, makes a drawing of all the sort of different people he sees. Presumably that guy on the right is, a, is maybe a, a French officer, but you have all sorts of people there. You have an African American who was made into a, a soldier, um, perhaps from Rhode Island. Um, which had its own kind of, which had its own African American unit, um, but also increasingly brought into the all the parts of the army in these years. Um, 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 eventually, this this sense, this, this um, over time, these officers who are feeling so disoriented or are feeling so separated, feeling such anxiety, by the end of the revolution, are coming to feel that um, they are close to each other that they have a kind of camaraderie, that they have a kind of common purpose. Partly encouraged through Freemasonry, of course, but in some ways just holding on the war and feeling like you've suffered all these years there. Um, um, so eventually, as the, at the end of the war, leads to the Society of the Cincinnati, which is a group um, designed to recall that sense of common bond, that sense of um, common purpose um, that the officers felt there. Um, um, and the Cincinnati, in some ways, here we'll go on to the next one now. The, um, um, let's move on. Let's move on to the um, move on to the Society of Cincinnati. This is one of the certificates. Remember, you saw the you saw the eagle on the on sort of the lapel of, of Rufus, Rufus Putnam. There, he he has he has his eagle there. To uh, but essentially, you can see here, not quite Masonic symbolism, but certainly. You know, within that same kind of bounds, if you know Masonic sort of things, you look at that and you say, you know, that's that's part of that same kind of universe. So, so even the Society of Cincinnati sort of draws upon Masonic sort of things to do there. So, um, and and these Mas and these ties go beyond this building of this kind of sense of common bonds. Uh, Masons um, in the Masons within these groups are often having fellowship with local. With local lodges as well, um, then there's also a sense, some sort of sense of camaraderie, with the other side, with the other side's military, because these are masons. You're you're part of that kind of bond. So um, General Parsons, um, um, his um, his troops actually um, um, discover the chest of one of the lodges with all this, which all the, with all of the paraphernalia with the probably with a charter in it. And, and so Parsons makes them return it. Sends this beautiful letter saying, you know, as Masons, you know, yes, we may be fighting. In, in the political ways, but we're still brothers. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of American Masons also um, had joined because of the sense that that, that kind of bond would continue and that you might do better if you were captured. 
there's also that sort of thing. And of course, being captured is a pretty awful thing um, for both sides. Um, and so having that Masonic bond might, might make things better. And all sorts of stories of, of uh, people being captured by Indians um, and, and using their Masonic distress signal and sort of being saved there. And, and it does seem there are some convincing stories there. And we actually have a, there actually is a, um, I think, yeah, I think we have the, um, no, we don't. OK. Um, let's leave it there. We'll get there. So let's, um, 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 so actually, there are sort of examples of, of someone's flashing those things. They're about ready to be killed. And they are sort of, they are sort of released from that being killed, sometimes already be, they're fearing torture even, but is that. So sadly, sometimes it doesn't work. It's sort of, sort of a tough sort of thing. They think they're doing it to, to a mason, and it doesn't happen. Um, and actually, Boston, Philadelphia, they, act, they sort of use that to help other, um, to help the soldiers, the, the British soldiers within their, within their area, sort of going out of their way to to aid those people, um, the, the brothers and that other sort of thing. So, so this is necessary for the, con the continuation of the revolution. So, so, so this is a group that has, masonry has this kind of significant impact on the, on the Continental Army, as I've argued, on the revolution itself. Um, um, but I think the officer corps also has a significant um, role in shaping the the fate of Freemasonry. So there's that feedback there. The, uh, this um, uh, helps Masonry to deal with the problems of the war. This is, Masonry is, has huge problems as a result of the revolution. It's hard to keep things going while you have that kind of war. Um, um, and by the end of the revolution, it's not clear what, what side Masonry is on. And it's more made worse by the fact that some, some lodges begin to say, hey, we're you know, we're, we're going to keep our British connection. That's what masonry is about there. And so it's, but it's odd to think about that in a new nation where people are trying to think about independence. And actually, Paul Revere is, is adamant about this. He creates a, he creates a, um, a, a lodge out of, his, out of the Lodge of St. Andrews to get away and say, hey, we're not going to leave the, Brit not going to leave the Scottish Grand Lodge there. So. Uh, but that's, that's a tough kind of thing. And the, um, the Continental Armies and George Washington in particular helped to create the, the, the sense that Freemasonry is part of that national story, that it's part of that new kind of nation. Um, and so it's not surprising that, um, these, that, that, that Masonic officers are the first to suggest a general grand master, a, a grand master for America there. And so, in fact, the American Union Lodge, as far as I can tell, is the very first group to do that in 1779, again. Um, and a number of officers held a meeting to do that. Um, and they never say until later on that who's the natural guy to do this. But sort of, I think it's sort of implied there that, that it's George Washington who is, the, who is the guy who would be that first grand master for the whole nation. In fact, people talk about People write to Washington or talk about him for years afterwards. Say, of course, you're the head of Masons throughout the throughout the nation, aren't you? Kind of thing. And that's the um, that's the thing. So, um, and so I want to end with this. Sort of, we began with the with the Washington Cross in the Delaware. This giant, this giant kind of figure. Um, we'll end with another giant figure, also George Washington. Uh, no, that's there. We're this, we're done for the uh, we're done there. Um, um, this is this is actually a painting by Emanuel Leutze, the guy who did Washington Cross in Delaware. This is actually this is actually a uh, painting in um, in Lexington, Massachusetts, the Northern Scottish Rite. Um, their their museum has this sort of thing, and here's um, another giant giant painting. Um, but here's Washington as as a master of a lodge, sort of trying to bring together the nation, trying to calm it and bring there. So it's, that's, that's the sort of image I want to leave with you, that, that sense of masonry connecting with the, with the nation. And if you want to stick around for the next thing and sort of hear about that, how that develops 
and how masonry has this huge kind of um, increase after the, after the revolution. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and kind of extraordinarily, do we have time for questions, or are we? Yeah, or do we, we need to? Questions and um, we'll, uh, we'll take about. A oh, maybe we don't. Break. Uh, maybe we don't. Maybe we just have okay. a couple of minutes to maybe have time for a couple of questions, and um, we'll see where we. Anybody want to? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, no, no, my brain just. <laughs> again, These I, I know. Sat through me for a whole morning. And, oh, well, great! I want to hear the. Oh. Tired of hearing me talk. That's okay. Uh, now the. <laughs> um, the when the lodges in North Carolina met up with Brother Cornwallis, he shut them down systematically, except for the one in Edenton, cutting out all of what he thought were lines of communication for. for Did he the, really? Is that fascinating? It, I should have. He destroys the, uh, all the records. Uh, St. John's Lodge, the oldest lodge here, no one has records from 1755. They start from 1788, after seven years of the dark. Uh, but is there any evidence of that happening also in the north or through your research of um, other brothers of the, on the, on the his yeah, Majesty's yeah. Royal Army side coming through and systematically yeah, that, No, not systematically. And, and I guess the, the New York, the, you know, the, the masonry continues during the occupation there. They have a hard time keeping going, but there's, as far as I, that's, that's not, I think, because the British... Um, stop it. It's just, you know, it's just, it's so confusing and tough to keep things going, I think. So, like a split house, so that, almost, it just it, like the house divided, kind of? I think, yeah, yeah. And it's just tough, tough to keep things going if, if the question is how can you afford those, how can you afford the bread which is now 10 times the price of what you used to pay? I think that's the, um, that's the sort of thing. So, that's really fascinating. I'll have to, so, and I apologize for missing sense. No, no. So, sounds great. Yes? In your research, have you had any indication, concrete indication, that Alec Hamilton was a member of the fraternity? Senator Hamilton? No, I haven't. And I don't think, I think people have, people have been desperately trying to run people down for many years. and doesn't seem to be any evidence. Um, the, great, the great sort of white whale of, of Masonic research, for those who think of that as their central kind of thing, is, of course, the... Um, Thomas Jefferson is Freemason. Uh, ah, are you an Alexander Hamilton? Well, I knew it. Uh, uh, one African American in there in your research, have you run across anything on Christmas addicts? Um, no, although I think he was, I think he was, he was from more like, um, I think it's more like Natick or Framingham, more than this has. Um, so I think he was somebody from outside there. Um, so, I, so I think of not as sort of an urban kind of guy, which would have been the only people who probably would have had a connection there. So he's clearly not part of that, of that Prince Hall group that um, actually is created by a British officer um, there. So somebody who comes in. So actually you have that there. You have, um, um, you have a British soldier group or British soldier, actually, it's, it's not a group, and, and you have to, well, it's just this guy, actually, as far as we know, um, which for people who are, who are, you know, just, who are hard line about strict sort of thing, this is, I think they've, this is really frustrating for them, but um, he initiates them, it seems like it's a, teaches them about Freemasonry in an accurate kind of way, enough to get them going in that way, so, so there is that, I'm trying to think of, uh, as far as was I know, it was It was clearly not a. It was, clear, it was clearly not a military lodge. So, and um, and actually, when um, there's stuff in my head, it just doesn't necessarily come out. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, when, when the Grand Lodge is formed by the Lodge of St. Andrew, um, they, they got in their, their sticklers at this point because they want to, you know, they want to make sure they're seen as legitimate by the, by the other people particularly. Um, when they create their Grand Lodge, early 70s, maybe late 60s, um, 
they actually have a couple of, I think, British lodges um, to sort of make up the requisite number. Something like five, maybe. Um, so they don't have a lot of lodges. So, so they do part of, they're part of that. They're part of that thing. So, um, so and weirdly enough, because they're, because they're, they're sort of nursing the, they're sort of nursing the lodge that's going to, you know, come up to bite them. Um, 